Hi again everyone, Chris Tisdale here. In this presentation I'm going to continue my series of videos on partial differential equations. And in particular we're going to solve a heat equation or a diffusion equation subject to some Cauchy data in this presentation. So this is the, uh, the heat equation or the diffusion equation here. So think of T as time, X as a spatial dimension and, and K as a positive constant. So you might represent, for example, the temperature at a point X and time T. In previous video, videos, we've solved the wave equation by simple factorizations. The method that I'm going to show you today is a little bit more convoluted and a little bit more difficult. Uh, now the ideas will guide us on solving a range of other second order problems. Okay, so this is the particular problem that we're going to look at. You've got the diffusion or heat equation here. You've got some Cauchy data. So if you, for example, represents temperature, then at time t equals zero, this phi function would represent the initial temperature. So we're going to uh, form an explicit uh, formula for the solution by solving a, a related problem. Now, in, in previous videos, we looked at five important invariance properties of the uh, diffusion equation or the heat equation. Okay, and I spent quite a bit of time proving each one of these five um, properties. Now, we're going to use those or apply those properties in the proof of today's um, video. Okay, so we'll come back to those. Okay, so instead of directly dealing with this problem, we're going to define a modified or related problem. We'll, we'll keep essentially the, the PDE, but we'll change the Cauchy data. Okay, so in this um, context, The Cauchy data is like a heavy side step function. Okay. So you can see at x equals zero, the function, if you like, gets turned on and the profile looks like uh, a step. All right, so we're gonna solve this problem and we're going to then relate the solutions back to the original problem one, two, by using the translation and integral properties that I talked about in my previous video videos. Okay, so we are going to solve this problem by assuming that the solution be Q is in a particular form. Okay, so it it's involves a function g and the argument is x on root 4kt. Now the, the question is why? Why can you make that assumption? Why should the solution to this problem look like this? Well, the dilation property of 3 discussed in, in uh, property 5 means that the following dilations do not affect the PDE3. And you can check also that they don't affect this heavy side step condition. Well, how can this happen? Well, Q must be a function of the ratio X on root T. Let me talk about that a bit further because this is, a, this is a, a, an important part. Okay, so we have uniqueness of solutions to this, this problem, and that can be proved. In fact, I'll prove that in other videos. The dilation property says that both Q of root A, AT, and Q of X, comma T both solve 3, 4 then by uniqueness, these two expressions must be equal. 
So by uniqueness, these two things must be equal. They, they must be one and the same function. So this, is, this relationship is true for all positive numbers A and all positive numbers T. Okay? So it's true for all T greater than 0 and all A greater than 0. So let's choose a particular value of A such that this argument reduces essentially to a constant. Okay? So what do we have then? We have... Okay, so if I replace that with the square root of that, I'm going to get the following. And over here, I'm going to get the t's cancelling out, and I'll just get 1 on 4k. So essentially, this has become a constant now. Okay, so now if I define g of, uh, let's say, z to be this q, big Q, of z comma 1 on 4k, I've now shown that solutions to this problem must be of this form. Okay, so how can this happen? Well, big Q must be a function of this ratio. Or in fact, what I've done in the argument above is shown that it's just a ratio of the following a function of this ratio. Now, the root 4k here is just here for a little bit of convenience. Okay, so that'll that'll just make the uh, algebra a little bit cleaner a bit later on. Okay. All right, well, this type of um, method is known as producing some sort of invariant transformations. And you can use this idea to solve a whole bunch of uh, PDE. And you just essentially look at the ratio. So, for example, if you let big X and big T be these uh, expressions, then you look at the ratio. So you have the same sort of ratio with these variables over here as you have over here. Okay, so in this case we've, we've used something like this ratio. Okay, so let's solve 3 and 4, our modified problem, if you like, using this particular form. Okay, and like I said before, the root 4k is there for a little bit of convenience. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to reduce this problem down to uh, an ODE, an ordinary differential equation. Okay, so what I need to do is from this form calculate the partial derivatives that lie in 3. Okay, so if I use the chain rule to compute q sub t, q sub x, and q sub xx, with a little bit of work you can come up with these expressions. Okay, so here we're using. The chain rule. Okay, so let's put these all together and just simplifying the notation with this p x on root 4kt, I come up with the following. Okay, now t is greater than zero so this, this will cancel out and I'll end up with my ODE. Now this is a second order linear ODE for G, and we've made the substitution P equals X on root 4KT. Now the um, coefficient here is not constant, that's actually the variable P, but we can solve this uh, reasonably easily. So how do we do that? Well, you can see I've got a double derivative there and a single derivative there and nothing else, so I can make a substitution. I'm going to let Z g prime. Okay, now now the z here doesn't have anything to do with the z over here, all right? So if I let z equal g prime, then this will become z prime, this will become z. So I've got z prime plus 2p 
uh, z equals zero, which is just the same as this. This is a first order differential equation, that I, a first order linear one that is actually solvable using an exponential function. So, if I form the general solution to this problem, I know what z is. What I have to do then is integrate z to get g. So in the next step, I've integrated from 0 up to uh, p, and I get the following expression where big A and big B in this context are constants. Okay, so if I can find my big A and big B, then essentially I've got my, pro my solution. Okay, so how do I find my big A and big B? Well, I haven't used my heavy side step function type uh, Cauchy data yet. Okay, so we'll come to that in a minute. Now, if I just sort of switch back to the p equals x on root 4kt, this is my general form for the solution to our modified or related problem 3, 4. Now, you can see that this solution only makes sense for t greater than 0, because you can't divide by 0 here, obviously. Okay. Right, so how do we find these a and b? Let's use the heavy side step type data. So here's our data here. So you'll, you'll, you'll notice that if we try to use the data, then we'd be dividing by zero. So that's, that's not allowed. So what we're going to do is sneakily approach zero from the right when x is greater than zero and when x is less than zero. So, that, so basically this is the split for your heavy side step function. Okay, so well, what happens then? Well, if x is greater than zero, this is 1, okay? So this goes up here, and I can go back in here and take the limit as t approaches 0 from the right. This will become positive in, or 10 to positive infinity. Okay, so that's where we get that line from. And similarly, if we um, have x less than 0, then this is 0, and we again approach t again, and we get this kind of um, improper integral. Okay, now what is this? Well, this is a lot like the so called error function. Okay, and in fact, this identity is the limit of the error function. Okay, so that you can prove this um, using, for example, um, uh, double integrals and polar coordinates. Okay, so this goes to pi on 2, this goes to negative pi on 2, uh, just by, say, switching the integral signs around and using the fact that e to the minus s squared is an even function. So you get two simultaneous equations. So you can solve for a and b now. If you add them together, you'll get... Um, b equals a half, and if you take one away from the other, you'll get a equals 1 on root pi. Thus, we now have an expression for our solution to the modified problem, 3, 4. Okay, now we've got to get, get back to the, the problem that we started with. We want to somehow relate the solution to the 3, 4 to 1, 2. Okay. All right, so that was a fair bit of work. Now, by one of the five properties that I showed you at the start, we know the derivative of Q, uh, it's, it's property 2, the derivative of Q is also a solution to uh, the uh, heat or diffusion equation. So, 
to find s to be the, this derivative, now given any suitable phi that makes this integral converge, consider this expression. Okay? Now, by the translate and the integral property, this is also a solution to the diffusion equation 1. The last thing, so, so essentially we've got a solution to 1. The last thing we've got to do is check that this Cauchy data or initial temperature is satisfied. Okay, how do we do that? Well, this, under this notation, this is just this. And if we integrate by parts, we can get to the following. And essentially, you want to show that at, at, when t equals 0, this, this is just phi of x. Okay, now, assuming that phi, my initial temperature, is 0 for large values or large values of plus or minus y, then we get the following. Okay, this will go to 0 and be essentially be left with this, okay, and if I split up this integral, then I can use the properties of the Heaviside step function. actually simplify this okay so this is going to be 1 when x minus y is greater than 0 and this is going to be 0 when x minus y is less than 0 so if you split that up into these two integrals this is going to be 1, uh, one here and this is going to be 0 here so this is what we get now if you integrate that again using this property you'll just be left with a 5x there okay so we've used the initial heavy side data for q there so what do we get? We get 5x, which is exactly what we, what we wanted. So we conclude that our u really is a solution to 1, 2, where I can compute this s just from q, okay, just by differentiating it. And, okay, here's my q. Just take the derivative of that with respect to x, and I get this. Okay, so what I can do now is write down the explicit solution. This will go to this, and this then is my solution to the heat equation. Okay, I, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you find it useful. Please join me. I'll do some more examples in, in the upcoming videos.